for all coming, not being frightened away or uh, being afraid of the coronavirus issue. No, I'm not Bertrand Mateus, who's supposed to be doing this introduction. Bertrand's uh, university is on lockdown, and he was unable to come, so instead of Bertrand, Christian Gertz, and myself, Rick Steer, there's only two of us to run the show today. And Frank, I'm going to eat in the back with DGF, who's put all this together. So welcome, everyone. Um, a little bit of business first. Restrooms, if you need them, across the way. Uh, there's also a exhibit room over there where we'll be having morning break and afternoon breaks. Lunch will be downstairs in the main lobby. Um, we will be doing a sensory program through in the course of this. That's why all the blue glasses are in the back. Some of the talks have changed. So you may, you if, if a talk has changed considerably, you will get a PDF from the speaker with the updated program. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, Kemen, Filter Corp, Max Fry, and who was the fourth one? Uh, Bruker. Sorry, sorry about that, Bruker. It was up there, and I thought I had a prompt, but I didn't. But again, thank you for being here with this coronavirus issue that's now become a global issue. Uh, if you come from the United States, you know, the media has tried very hard to frighten everyone over there. Correct, Rob? <laughs> Um, I don't know how it is in Europe and other parts of the world, but listen to the expert. You know, experts. We're scientists. You know, we should be able to call the the fact from the hype. The populations that are sensitive are the older ones. Well, we have a term we use in food safety training. It's called UPI. Y O P I. The young the old, pregnant women, and the immunocompromised. You know, most of the deaths, you know, unfortunately, we have had some, some of those around the world have been older people, particularly people with respiratory or cardiac ailments. You know, so again, it's up to us to help assuage the, the fear that people have. Fortunately, you know, we're not as crazy as they are in some places in the world. Some of you may have seen on the news the, the battle royal between two people in an Australian supermarket where they were fighting over the last roll of toilet paper that was on the shelf. Uh, Sevim Saritas, who's out front, is, is Australian, and she had to email her friends and say, boy, you guys are embarrassing. You're embarrassing the country, and you're embarrassing me. So anyway, we will be together for the next two days. Uh, the slides are mostly in the binders. You can follow along. As I said, if we do have changes, you will get a PDF with those changes. We encourage questions, but do hold them till the end of the presentations. And Christian, I guess it's your turn then, huh? <laughs> oh, I do have a souvenir. This is the 10th um, international pro program on deep fat frying. I actually brought my book, my Eurofed lipids book, from the first one we did here back in 2000. And that was when I got involved with this program. So it's been 20 years for me. and. I don't know how many for you, Christian. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. Um, enjoy the meeting and have fun. Thank you, Rick, for the introduction. And I will continue the introduction with the history of uh, this symposia. Uh, was a, a symposium organized by the DGF. Uh, I remember 
the f the first I attend I attended it was in uh, 1979, but uh, there's one before that doesn't work. No? First, no. Hmm? Uh -huh. Okay, okay. This was the first one in 1972, and you see that the topics are not very different from those we have today. Always the same problem with the technology, the oil uptake. This will demonstrate it today by Rob Brennan and analytical methods. The discussion about the analytical methods that lasts more than 50 years and uh, health, nutrition, and legal regulations. Uh, look here, it's a little bit different from those. This view, uh, this was very, very well ordered, and I, 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 I saw, I read that it was about 120 persons which have been there. And, uh, Ms. Mankel, this was the inventor of the oxidized fatty acids. Uh, it was uh, a colleague from the uh, official institute in Bochum. At, uh, um, during this meeting, she said that she has analyzed 69 samples in one year, and 50% of these samples were abused frying oils, as you must imagine. 69 samples. They have been analyzed in a laboratory for one year. Now we can do it in one year. And that was a, 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 some impression of this well-ordered symposium. Uh, the, the second, uh, the, the recommendation at the, at the end, we had some recommendations, and these recommendations were given for some analytical values in petroleum insoluble oxidized fatty acids. That is a method which takes about two days to be analyzed. To, 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 such, to get one value you need at those times, two days. Subunication value, no importance today. Acid value is still relevant, and spoke point in some countries is still a uh, uh, criteria. The second one. That is the first uh, symposium where I also at attended. Uh, you see here the criteria of petrol ether oxidized fatty acids, still mentioned in our regulations in, Euro in Germany. We have the polar compound that I published in 1976. It was my first paper I published. It was the development of the polar compounds. And it is just the uh, the, the, uh, they mentioned the ampulla uh, uh, level. Uh, that now it is calculated by the difference, acid value, and also smoke point. All these criteria are still valid in Germany. Uh, the third, that was the first, which we have organized. The, 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 the DGF has organized all the, the, the symposia, but the first, uh, Rick and me, we said we cannot wait more than 20 years. We have to, to make a new uh, symposium to discuss the new criteria, the new analytical possibilities, and also the change in the um, uh, production of uh, fried food. And th that was. At first, the, the, always the same uh, uh, topics, leisure regulations, healthy aspects. Here already mentioned the possibilities of the uh, near-infrared spectroscopy, uh, uh, quick test. That was the first time that Testo, uh, Abro, uh, uh, and Abro, uh, and uh, uh, Frischek uh, demonstrate a new possibility to measure the polar compounds. Uh, 3M, this was another uh, yes, semi-quantitative test. And uh, at, at the end, we have discussed the possibility to define new analytical criteria for the frying fats and oils 
and to determine their uh, level of dis, uh, dis, uh, degradation. Uh, also, the, the, the first is also the most important paper uh, in the, um, concerning frying fats and oils. It was a, 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 the lecture of Olivier Ritrac. It was his uh, PhD uh, uh, theme transfer, that heat and mass transfer. Uh, and that is a very important paper. And based on this paper, uh, more. Uh, a better understanding could be developed concerning frying fats and oils. And this is also a topic which will be today discussed by Felix Alabadin, natural and oxidative components to check the possibility to um, stabilize frying fats and oils. But the recommendation at that, those times was uh, the total polar compounds below 24 and the polymers. And also to say, you have to continue the research. And we have also made some demonstrations. Uh, this was not a problem of the, of the operators. It was more a problem of the, the energy supply here in this stadium, because too much uh, uh, current was used. And therefore, they, uh, we had a lot of problems with this fryer works. <laughs> it was here also the demonstration of the quick tests. Okay, then the, the, the continue the, the, the following uh, symposia on deep frying, also the, the, the topics. It's always, I think, mainly the, 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 to check the possibilities to uh, develop new systems for optimum frying and also to, to find new criteria or better criteria to find out the state of degradation. Okay. That is, was a short overview about the history of the, uh, of the uh, symposia we had uh, organized in the world. This is the first, uh, fourth time that we are here. We have been in, in China. We have been in San Francisco, in Munich. And it was, uh, I think, the symposia is, is I think, is a very important tool to find new regulations in the world. Thank you very much for the first uh, presentation. And I will now ask uh, Rick uh, is, to start with his first presentation. Uh, the, the topic is how the different cultures and habits in the world have an influence on the safety of fried food. Rick. So I am back, as Mr. Schwarzenegger said in one of his movies. Um, so I don't know how many of you have had a chance to travel, you know, the world, particularly Asia, Australia, and see things, see what people eat around the world. Let's see which one advances. You know, but. People fry food all over the world. And why we do it, it's pretty simple. Fried food tastes good. Wonderful aroma, good flavors, textures, nice mouth feel, you know, all that evil fat that the food picks up, you know, releases onto your tongue and just feels, feels good, you know. People enjoy eating. And fried food is something that people enjoy. It's, we call it comfort food in the United States. You know, and there are probably similar terms all over the world. But the other thing is it's a very efficient way to prepare food. You know, if you bring home a piece of chicken and you decide to put it in the oven, it's going to take you, you know, after you've got it ready, 25, 30, 35 minutes or more to get that chicken cooked up. But you batter and bread that and drop it into a fry pot, well, you get that chicken in four to six minutes. 
So if you're a restaurant operator, what are you going to choose? You're going to choose something that works quickly and easily, and you can crank out food for your customers. You know, this is why the fast food chains have fryers. This is why most restaurants have fryers. This is why food service operates, because it's a quick, easy way to produce good-tasting food. And coincidentally, the lethality, you know, when you cook a piece of food in a fryer at you know, 160, 170 degrees Celsius, you're pumping a lot of lethality into that product. So it's going to be safe. Yeah. One of the cup groups I work with are the, is the California Almond Board. And the Almond Board of California had a couple of problems, you know, in 2001 and 2004. People got salmonella from eating raw almonds. So what they said is almonds that are sold in California now have to be processed using process, processes developed by recognized thermal process authorities. So what they have done is validated the processes for deep frying almonds. Yeah. So you can be pretty sure if you buy a California almond that's oil roasted, it has been given enough lethality to be safe. But again, there are foods around the world that we enjoy. You know, in Europe, you've got fried snacks, fish and chips in the UK. You know, my lady friend is Austrian, you know, and swears by her schnitzel. You know, she says it's better than figgy moolers in Vienna, but I'm not going to argue with her because then I'm going to be in trouble. But again, these are things that we really enjoy you know, in this country, in this part of the world. You go to Asia. Well, if you've had the opportunity to travel extensively in Asia, you probably realize that they eat a lot of things that Americans, Canadians, Europeans would go, you really are not going to eat that, are you? Oh, yeah, you know, insects, you know. The picture I had earlier with the frying, you know, why frying is good, had pictures of, had a picture of a plate with deep fried cicadas on it. You know, yes, I've had a deep fried cicada. It's not too bad, but one was more than enough. <laughs> I also had a deep fried scorpion. Um, which, and one was definitely more than enough of that because scorpions are full of formic acid. So it wasn't the most tasty thing in the world. But, you know, I was talking to Rob Brannan. Up on the top right, you see tempeh, you know, which is a dish that is very popular in the Philippines. Soybeans that have been boiled, inoculated with a mold, the mold grows together binding the soybeans they put it in a deep fryer and it's delicious crunchy snack but of course we have a problem there is any culture that uses a lot of mold fermented foods also has usually higher levels of cancers stomach kidney bladder cancers so if you're going to live in the Philippines and enjoy things like that, well, you know, there is a higher risk for chronic exposure to mycotoxins. You have fried seafood products. You have things that you pick up in the open air market, you know. When I've traveled in China, you know, because I do have a food allergy, I'm allergic to shrimp, you know, I would ask what is in this dish and one of the women I was traveling with said to me, Rick, please stop asking. I don't want to know what we're eating. I said, but I've got to. I'm sorry, Pam. You know, and again, they eat very strange things. Getting back to our coronavirus, you know, one of the early theories was this virus originated in the markets where you can go and buy things like rats and dogs and 
chickens and snakes and other creatures, you know, very fresh food, you know. You buy the rat and you take it home. And the Chinese people have told me, oh no, never rats from the city. They are not good. You always buy the rats from the rice field. They are fat and healthy and very tasty. Okay. The Americas. If you travel in southwest US, uh, Mexico, South America, you see people eating churros, you know, other fried products. You know, you go to the markets, you know, the United States and Europe, you see all kinds of par fried items. French fries, fish, uh, meat products, dumplings. So things, every th everybody has different products all over the world. Despite the fact that nutritionists all over the world condemn frying, you know, you're taking up too much fat, it's going to make you obese. Well, everything in moderation. You know, you don't have to eat churros and french fries every day of the year. But every once in a while, you know, it's that comfort food. You know, you've had a bad day, you pick up something from the market, a nice fried food with a cold beer or a glass of wine at the end of the day, you know, helps take the edge off. Okay. Now it's not advancing. Hmm? Where is escape? Which one is escape? <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Snacks. It's time. No, it just got stuck. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. So. Okay, where are we? There we are. We also have lots of fried snacks. Um, chips or crisps, you know. I always get a kick out of traveling in the UK because they have so many flavors of crisps. They, they, they dwarf what we have in the United States. But, you know, some of the larger players are now coming out with more gourmet flavors. I have a friend who's a consultant in uh, the East Coast, has a company called the UNI Group, and they did some work with Frito-Lay a number of years ago to encourage the adoption of more you know, gourmet flavors with the company. You know, Utz is a big brand back on the East Coast out of Pennsylvania. You know, donuts, Krapfen, you know. Again, an indulgence. If you ever get to New Orleans and deep south, you know, there's a donut chain down there called Krispy Kreme. The friends of mine who live in New Orleans say, if you want to find the policeman, you don't call 911 or call the police station, you call the local Krispy Kreme, and that's where the cops are going to be. <laughs> and of course, lots of stuff in the frozen food section. Um, you know, chicken, uh, poppers, you know, uh, jala you know, jalapenos stuffed with cheese, battered and deep fried, you know, all kinds of things. You know, I remember in college, we had an all-night market in my town. And one of the more fun 